Hi, I'm Keenan Crane. I'm a professor of computer science and robotics at Carnegie Mellon University. And this is the second of two lectures on uh, using intrinsic triangulations for geometry processing. So this time I'm gonna look a bit more on the algorithm side. Just as a reminder, the high level idea was that rather than working with an ordinary triangle mesh in R3, we're gonna allow ourselves to sort of draw different triangulations over the same polyhedral surfaces where edges are now no longer just straight segments through space, but rather sort of curved paths that go along the original surface. Or more abstractly, an intrinsic triangulation is given by just connectivity plus edge lengths rather than connectivity plus vertex positions. Okay, so just to recap, yesterday we gave some basic background on intrinsic triangulations and introduced two data structures for tracking the correspondence between triangulations, both signposts and normal coordinates. Today we're gonna to look at some things we can build on top of those data structures, including a new discrete Laplace operator and a new flip-based algorithm for computing geodesics, as well as some interesting open questions. Okay, so first up is the Laplacian, which as I've mentioned a few times already, is something that gets used all over geometry processing. And this is work with Nick Sharp. So up until now, we've made a simplifying assumption about our geometry, which is that it's manifold. So there are a lot of different ways to say what this means, but for a triangle mesh, a simplicial surface, one way to talk about a manifold is to say that the link of every interior vertex is a single loop, or if it's a boundary vertex, then it's a single path. So for instance, the edge on top is an edge of a manifold mesh. I have two triangles containing the edge. If I have more than two triangles containing the edge, then that edge is non-manifold. If I have a vertex in a manifold mesh, then I know that it'll only have a single cone of triangles around the vertex. Whereas if I'm in a non-manifold mesh, I might have kind of multiple cones touching that vertex. Okay, so this idea of using a manifold mesh is often assumed because it makes algorithms easier to think about, easier to write down, but of course, in the real world, we want algorithms that work on all different kinds of meshes, not just manifold ones. And so what we're gonna do is introduce a new idea called a tufted cover to extend this machinery of intrinsic triangulations to all meshes, including non-manifold meshes. And what's nice about this construction is that it's gonna kind of provide a bridge between existing algorithms that work on only manifold meshes and the more common non-manifold data that's often found in practice. And also we're gonna be able to extend in the same way algorithms for meshes to point clouds. Okay, so one reasonable question to ask is, well, why is our data manifold in the first place? I mean, couldn't we just always work with manifold data? Well, one place that non-manifold models come from is ones that are built um, for visualization purposes, where there's really no need for them to be manifold. And yet somewhere down the line, it might still be useful to do some kind of analysis or simulation or processing of these models that we thought we were just making for visualization. Another is that geometric algorithms themselves may produce non-manifold output, even if the geometry they're supposed to represent is manifold. So in a lot of, let's say, scanning and reconstruction algorithms, you could easily have little topological defects that don't reflect the actual shape and produce these non-manifold features. There are also times when the phenomenon that you're studying truly is non-manifold. So you have maybe physical interfaces between multiple liquids or you have foams or whatever, where you have this kind of non-manifold meeting of different pieces. And finally, as we'll see today, triangulations that we want to associate with point clouds, so triangulations that are easy to build from point clouds, can be extremely non-manifold. And so for a lot of good reasons, and just in general, um, non-manifold meshes are what most people would just call meshes, right? This idea of working only with manifold meshes is kind of an academic idea. When you get out there in the real world, we really want to solve this general case and work on all possible kinds of data. Um, if we want to do geometry processing on general meshes, one very important ob object that we've talked about before is a discrete Laplace operator, which turns out to be kind of a Swiss army knife for geometric algorithms, much in the same way that the fast Fourier transform is kind of a Swiss army knife in traditional signal processing. Now, if you look at the formal definition of Laplace Beltrami, it typically assumes that you have a manifold, but fundamentally the idea that's captured by the Laplacian uh, makes perfect sense even for domains that are not manifold. 
For instance, if you imagine that you weld together metal sheets in a non-manifold way, then you can certainly talk about things like how does heat diffuse through this domain? And so you could kind of flip the heat equation around and say, okay, rather than thinking of the time derivative as being governed by the Laplacian, we're gonna look at the way that heat spreads out over the, the domain and say the time derivative of that process at time zero gives us a definition for our Laplacian. Similarly, I could imagine taking this non-manifold object and thickening it, maybe by a ball of radius epsilon, okay? And then this non-manifold surface in this case becomes a manifold volume where we have a Laplacian that's defined in a classical sense. It makes perfectly good sense to solve problems with this volumetric Laplacian. And then you could think about, well, what happens to this solution as this thickening gets smaller and smaller and smaller? And the Laplacian that I'll define today behaves this way. If you compare the results from these two different kinds of uh, solves, you get very similar results. Okay, and on and on. The Laplacian can also be thought of as describing a deviation from a local average in a function or connected to the variation of total surface area and many other things. And what you see in general is that the, the concept of the Laplacian, the thing that it tries to describe, is perfectly meaningful for non-manifold data. Okay, so how do we actually build a good discrete Laplacian for this kind of object? Well, remember that our basic tool for improving triangulations was to perform edge flips, intrinsic edge flips. And so we have a little bit of a conundrum, which is what could it possibly mean to flip a non-manifold edge? Right? If you try to think about this either extrinsically or intrinsically, it doesn't immediately make a whole lot of sense. And so we're actually gonna kind of sidestep this question and do something different. So the key observation is that many of the objects and algorithms we care about in geometry processing actually just need manifold edges, and they don't mind if there are non-manifold vertices in the mesh, okay? So our somewhat strange idea is to make all of the edges of the mesh manifold by making every single vertex non-manifold. And in particular, what we're gonna do is make two copies of every triangle, okay? But we're gonna glue back together the duplicated vertices. And then we're gonna glue the triangles together, these duplicated triangles together in some nice edge manifold way. Once we've done this, we can just go ahead and flip the edges as usual, right? So if we have input like this, we're gonna construct this, what we call tufted double cover. And this thing will, at the edges, just look like an ordinary mesh where we can perform edge flips to improve the quality. Okay, so overall it might look something like this. If we start out with this red triangle mesh, which is not manifold, we'll construct this tufted double cover. Why do we call it the tufted double cover? Well, because at the vertices, it kind of reminds you of um, tufted buttons, right? Although I should point out that this displacement of the surface is just for visualization purposes only. The actual geometry of this tufted double cover looks exactly like just two copies of this red mesh sitting right on top of each other, okay? More Precisely, the construction goes like this, okay? So first we're gonna make two disjoint copies of every triangle, and then glue the vertices back together, okay? So now we have these, these doubled copies uh, floating around in space, and around every edge of the original mesh, we're gonna glue these two copies together, front to back, front to back, front to back, around the edge. And so the only initial data we need here is some kind of ordering of faces around the non-manifold edges which is typically just given by the embedding of the initial mesh. We'll see later on that actually this ordering doesn't make too big of a impact on the final results actually. Okay, so once we have this tufted cover, we can start doing mesh processing that looks somewhat like ordinary mesh processing. In particular, we can build a very nice Laplace operator for any triangle mesh in a straightforward way. So what do we do? Well, first we construct this tufted cover then we flip the edges to an intrinsic Delaunay triangulation. And then on this final triangulation, we build the usual Cotan Laplace matrix. Basically, we just sum up the ordinary three by three uh, stiffness matrices per triangle. Um, we divide those by two because we have a double cover of the surface, but otherwise it's exactly like the ordinary Cotan Laplace. Okay, and here's the really key point. So because the vertices of our tufted cover 
are exactly the same as the vertices of our original mesh, right? We have exactly the same number of vertices and everything. This Laplace matrix can actually just be used on the original mesh directly, okay? So if you like, you could think of this tufted cover as just defining a bunch of nice basis functions for the original mesh. The key difference is that the edge weights are now guaranteed to be positive. So for instance, we're gonna get a discrete maximum principle and in practice, we just generally get a lot more accurate and reliable results when we plug this Laplacian into geometry processing algorithms, okay? I should be clear to point out though, that without doing these intrinsic edge flips, we just recover the ordinary Cotan Laplace matrix, right? So it really is the combination of building the tufted cover and flipping to Delaunay that gives us these nice properties. Another really important thing here that we've been kind of talking about all along is all of this complexity, building this cover, flipping to Delaunay and so on and so forth can be encapsulated in kind of a black box, right? You just have a little subroutine that goes through all these transformations and then just spits out an ordinary V by V matrix that you can use within your mesh like you would any other Laplace matrix, okay? So an important question you should ask about any discrete Laplacian is, well, what properties does it have? So ideally you would like your discrete, discrete Laplace operator to capture all of the properties that a smooth or continuous Laplacian has. So for instance, one thing we know for sure is it's symmetric, reflecting the fact that the smooth Laplace operator is self-adjoint. Why is that? Well, the Cotan matrix is symmetric. It has linear precision. So if we build this thing on a planar mesh, then linear functions will be in the kernel. And because we have flipped to this intrinsic Delaunay triangulation, we're guaranteed that we have positive edge weights, which implies we'll have a discrete maximum principle. So if we compute a discrete harmonic function, LU equals zero, then we can never have a local maximum or minimum at an interior vertex. And this is useful when we're using the Laplacian to do any kind of interpolation, right? A very, very fundamental task in geometry processing. One last property that you might look for is locality. So in the smooth setting, the Laplacian, just like any other differential operator, depends only on a, an arbitrarily small geometric neighborhood of a given point X. So for instance, a geodesic epsilon ball around X. What is the discrete analog of locality? Well, one idea that's been considered is to say um, that a discrete Laplace operator L has this locality property if the value of LU at vertex I depends only on values of U at vertices no more than K edges away in the input triangulation. Okay, so you pick some universal K, right? could be one, could be some larger number, and ask that computation is completely local. What is maybe a little bit strange about this definition, given all that we've said about intrinsic triangulations, in fact, given what Tullio Regge said about intrinsic triangulations, is that there's nothing particularly special about the edges of the input triangulation, right? The Laplace operator is something that depends only on the intrinsic geometry of the domain. We pick one particular set of edges to describe this geometry, to describe this domain, but the combinatorial distance, the distance along edges, can be very, very different from the geometric distance or the geodesic distance. So for instance, if we have this as our input triangulation, Right? We have white vertices that are directly connected to the black vertices, even though these white vertices are actually quite far away geometrically. The Delaunay triangulation, on the other hand, you know, at least guarantees that the vertex that's geodesically closest to each vertex is one of the neighbors in the triangulation. Okay, And so kind of an open question is to say, well, what's kind of a more natural geometric uh, notion of discrete locality? And can we find a discrete Laplace operator that satisfies all of these properties for that more geometric notion of locality? Okay. One very nice property that our tufted Laplacian does have is that even for manifold domains, it exhibits better behavior at the boundary than either the usual Cotan Laplacian or the intrinsic Laplacian of uh, Bobanko and Springborn. And the reason is basically that if you have an obtuse angle in a triangle at the boundary, then neither of these older Laplacians can provide positive edge weights, basically because they can't flip the boundary edges. Whereas in the tufted cover, you can flip all the edges 
to Delaunay edges. So if you have this, this edge along the boundary, then basically it's gonna kind of wrap around from front to back, okay? So as a kind of example problem, let's say we want to interpolate values at these two vertices. We set one of them to one, we set one of them to zero, and we'd like the smoothest function everywhere else on the domain. So we want the function that minimizes uh, Dirichlet energy or in equivalently is a discrete harmonic function. Okay, and our goal is, well, this is interpolation, so the values that we get everywhere else should remain within the range of the given data. And if we do this with cotan Laplace, we're gonna have, have values much bigger than one and smaller than one. Same with this traditional uh, intrinsic Delaunay Laplacian, uh, but with our tufted Laplacian, we get this interpolation property. Here's an interesting example where the solution really should be non-manifold, so computing soap films for minimal surfaces. So the idea is you take kind of a wire frame, you dip it in the soapy water, you pull it out, and sometimes you will get a minimal area surface or zero mean curvature surface that is non-manifold. So here we can apply a nice algorithm from Pinkall and Poltier to compute these surfaces. We just build the Laplacian for our current mesh. We solve for a discrete harmonic function, LF equals zero, subject to fixed boundary conditions, so fix the boundary vertices to this wire, and then repeat until convergence. And if we do this with our tufted Laplacian, we get a nice answer even, even from some very kind of crazy degenerate meshes. Also, what we notice is that switching to this tufted Laplacian avoids kind of non-physical local extrema. So if we do the same algorithm with a cotan Laplacian, we can get little bumps, little local maxima on the surface where the area is clearly not minimized geometrically, even though that's what our kind of discrete Laplace operator is telling us. This is also, by the way, a really great example of a problem where we're using intrinsic triangulations to actually solve for extrinsic geometry, to solve for a new embedding of the surface into space. In fact, here's another task of that type. We want to deform a shape by smoothly interpolating displacements of a few control handles. So again, we're gonna use the Laplacian to kind of define this smooth interpolation across the domain and then recover the deformation from derivatives of the embedding. Okay, so if we start with this crazy non-manifold mesh produced from a bunch of, in this case, mesh booleans, then Cotan Laplace totally fails to give us something reasonable, whereas this tufted Laplacian gives us a more plausible def deformation. Um, earlier on, I mentioned that we need an ordering of triangles around non-manifold edges, and this experiment just shows that the particular ordering really doesn't matter too much. So we can use the ordering induced by the embedding, we can order by triangle area, or we can use a random ordering, and in all three cases, we get almost identical results. And the reason basically is that all of these choices just induce very similar function spaces, very similar bases on the original domain. Finally, we've been talking all this time about meshes, but an increasingly popular geometric representation, uh, for instance, in machine learning, are point clouds. So there are a few different ways to define a point cloud Laplacian, um, but generally speaking, they aren't quite as nice as the ones that we have for meshes. So on the one hand, you can show some nice convergence properties like pointwise convergence if you have a very dense sampling of the point clouds. Uh, and the price you pay for that is that the matrices you get have way more non-zeros than the one we use for meshes and only get denser as you refine the point cloud. So very expensive computation. Also, if you've ever actually tried to use these in practice on real data, you will find that they have some parameters that can be very difficult to tune. So our idea is to say, well, how can we translate these nice, sparse, reliable mesh Laplacians to point clouds? And so what we do is, well, we first just take the local neighborhood of each point, all the local neighbors, and construct their Delaunay triangulation in kind of a best fit tangent plane, okay? We then take the union of the combinatorics of all these triangulations, which gives us kind of a total mess of a triangulation, but that's no problem because we know that we can simply build our tufted cover to get a kind of nicer space where we can flip edges and then flip to intrinsic Delaunay. And so we get this beautiful Laplacian in the end that's super sparse and generally behaves just as nicely as a mesh-based Laplacian. Right? There's no parameters to tune. We get the same kind of structural properties we get positive edge weights and so forth. As just one little comparison, uh, here we're gonna compute a harmonic greens function. So this is something that shows up in a lot of geometry processing and shape analysis applications. 
And whereas past Laplacians exhibit underflow or negative values, we get the expected result of a well-behaved uh, positive kernel. At a broader level, what's nice about this construction is that it provides a kind of bridge between point cloud processing and mesh-based algorithms. So now that we have a nice edge manifold mesh associated with our point cloud, we can just plug in well-known algorithms for, for instance, surface parameterization or computing the log map or you know whatever else we have hanging around. Okay, so let's now talk about a different task, an unrelated task, which is computing geodesic paths. And this is again, uh, joint work with Nick Sharp. So the problem here is you're given a curve on a surface and you wanna find a locally shortest path or geodesic in the same isotopy class. So for instance, we wanna start with this curve and sort of straighten it out into this curve or start with this curve and straighten it out into this curve. Now. One thing to notice about this second example, right, is that just because you can't make this curve any shorter locally does not mean that it's the globally shortest path, which would just directly connect the two marked points, okay? And we're happy with this. We actually want to be able to find paths beyond just minimal geodesics. So the word geodesic is quite often confused, especially in geometry processing, with the idea of a globally shortest path. But actually, a lot of algorithms in geometry processing actually need paths that are not necessarily the shortest one. So anything from cutting up and segmenting surfaces to building domains for finite element simulation. A way to motivate this isotopy condition is that many curves on surfaces are used to define region boundaries. So if we were to naively straighten out uh, the paths in this case, then we'd end up with some curves that don't clearly delineate two regions anymore. Whereas if you stay in the same isotopy class, this partition is still meaningful, okay? So in general, how can we do this? How can we shorten paths on uh, polyhedral surfaces? Well, a natural idea is to encode these curves as sort of polylines, so maybe store points uh, along edges of the triangulation, and then iteratively shorten the curve one vertex at a time, okay? So something like going from here to here, and then here to here, and so on, until hopefully this thing straightens out. One challenge here is that it can be tricky to guarantee that this procedure always converges, basically due to some difficulty around vertices. Another is that explicitly storing all these crossings can take a lot of storage. For instance, let's say you want geodesics from one source vertex to all other vertices, then you might end up with something like order n squared uh, storage. And also, even if you do this kind of procedure in the plane, you know, forget about all the geometric issues, it basically takes forever to converge because at each iteration, you're just making less and less and less and less progress. Right, so you're only converging to the, the solution in the limit. So our observation here is that, well, the edges of an intrinsic triangulation are already geodesic segments, right? So rather than try to slide a curve around on a fixed triangulation, why don't we modify the triangulation using edge flips so that its edges contain the final curve that we want, okay? And this perspective, this intrinsic perspective, leads to a remarkably simple algorithm where we just greedily flip edges until we have the path we want. So very similar in spirit to Lawson's greedy Delaunay flipping algorithm. This approach has a lot of nice features. For one thing, the configuration space of our curve is now discrete. It's just the flip graph of the triangulation. And what that means is we can reach the exact solution to the problem in finitely many steps rather than slowly converging to this shortest, locally shortest solution. In practice, the algorithm is extremely fast, just a few milliseconds, uh, even on meshes with millions of triangles. Similar to the curve shortening flow from the smooth case, um, embedded loops are guaranteed to remain embedded and shrink to geodesic loops or, or to points in finite time. And also, uh, and I think most interestingly, this same strategy generalizes really well. So it can be used to compute not just paths, but geodesic loops and curve networks and all sorts of other things. And this is where things really get interesting for geometry processing. So just as a sneak preview, this is what the algorithm looks like. So we keep flipping and flipping and flipping until we can't flip anymore. And although you know it looks like a lot of work, we're doing a lot of edge flips, uh, 11,000 edge flips, the actual compute time here is only about a hundredth of a second. So something that really works well on, on real models. 
Here's another more close-up example of a loop, and what you see is that as we start to flip edges, we leave sort of a wake of pretty awful skinny triangles behind the curve, which actually, given the robustness of these data structures that we talked about in the last lecture, um, don't really cause any problems. Though, as we'll see, if you do want a better triangulation after straightening, then of course you can just apply some of the same retriangulation tools we've already discussed. And this is kind of the whole point of doing it this way, right? By taking this intrinsic flip-based approach, we kind of put curve processing and surface triangulation in one unified framework. And what we're gonna see is that this has some nice consequences for geometry processing beyond just finding geodesic curves. So things are gonna to start to feel a little bit more like just doing good old fashioned computational geometry in the plane. Okay, but how does this all work? Well, first we have to agree on a definition for discrete geodesics. So in the smooth setting, geodesics have two equivalent characterizations. They're both straightest and locally shortest curves. In the discrete setting, actually it turns out these two notions no longer agree. So for instance, a straightest curve can pass through a vertex of positive curvature, whereas a locally shortest curve can always do better by going around this positive vertex. So in our case, we're gonna look for locally shortest geodesics. So this is the same notion of discrete geodesic that shows up in classic algorithms from computational geometry, like the mitchell mount papa Dimitrio algorithm. And just to be clear, uh, what we want is really exact polyhedral geodesics, not a numerical approximation that you might get from, for instance, solving a, a partial differential equation. Okay? So what does a locally shortest curve look like once we have it on a polyhedral surface? Well, consider a curve that's made by a sequence of edges in the triangulation. And at any vertex i, let alpha i min and alpha i max be the smaller and larger angle on either side. Okay, and also let capital theta be the sum of these two angles. Then one thing you can see is that the curve can't be made shorter at vertex i if and only if the smaller of the two angles, alpha i min, is greater than or equal to pi. Right? So for instance, a, a kind of degenerate case is it's a planar mesh, in which case this smaller angle for a, for a straight line would be exactly equal to pi. Okay, so this fact has a couple consequences. For one thing, as we said before, it means that a locally shortest curve can't pass through a positively curved or spherical vertex. On the other hand, there are actually many ways for a locally shortest curve to pass through a negative vertex or a saddle vertex, okay? So an exact polyhedral geodesic in the end will be something like a sequence of intrinsic edges passing only through saddle vertices and of course the, the two endpoints. So given this is what we wanna find, how do we, how do we actually compute it? Well, we said we're gonna take a greedy approach. So in this Lawson algorithm for, for finding a Delaunay triangulation, the atomic operation was to greedily flip a non-Delaunay edge. The atomic operation on our algorithm will, to be, will be to greedily flip edges at non-shortest vertices, at vertices where the curve can be kind of tightened. So intuitively we wanna pick a vertex and then sort of pull the path as tight as possible without crossing any other vertices. And the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna kind of clear the way by flipping edges in this little blue wedge next to the vertex until we know we can just slide this red curve over by an isotopy. Okay, and so this also gives us this isotopic property of the algorithm. More precisely, let's consider some vertex B where the smaller angle is less than pi, and let A and C be the two neighbors along our current path. Then what we're gonna do is look at uh, the other angles on the left side of this wedge, and while there's any angle that's less than pi, we're gonna repeatedly flip the edge incident on the first such angle in clockwise order, okay? Or counterclockwise order, doesn't matter. Um, once there are no more edges to flip, we'll just replace the current path with the path along the left side of this wedge. Okay, so something like this. We have an angle that is less than pi here, so we flip that edge. We have another angle that's less than pi, we flip that edge. We have another one, so we flip it. And in this case, things work out really simply. We just have one edge on the left side, so that becomes 
the new edge in our path. And of course, in this case, by triangle inequality, that new, new edge is shorter than the original path. Okay, but why should this always work, right? So we'd like to be able to show that if we have this sequence of two edges in our path that's not yet locally shortest, this little algorithm, this flip out algorithm will always produce a shorter path. So here's kind of a sketch of the proof. Here's what we, we need to do is we need to first show that any edge that needs to be flipped can be flipped, right? That we can actually execute this algorithm, right? So in our first lecture, we said that an edge uh, can be flipped if, well, if the two triangles containing that edge form a convex region, and if both endpoints of the edge have degree greater than one, right? Because if we flip an edge that has an endpoint of degree one, that vertex becomes degree zero, meaning it's just sitting inside of a triangle. That triangle is no longer just an ordinary Euclidean triangle. Okay. Next, we need to show that flipping an edge always decreases the number of edges that remain to be flipped so that the algorithm actually makes progress. And finally, we need to show that upon termination, this new path we get, the path along the other side of the, the wedge boundary, is always shorter than the initial pair of edges that we started with. To keep this brief, I'm just going to assume for simplicity that we're working with a simplicial complex and sketch out the proof. Uh, extending this to general delta complexes is, is pretty straightforward, but just annoying to kind of grind through all the details. Okay, so first step, we need to show that an edge that we want to flip or that we need to flip in this algorithm can be flipped. Okay, so suppose we have an edge bi, that's the next one that we need to flip. Well, I claim that the associated edge diamond is always convex, so that the union of the two triangles containing the edge. Why is that true? Well, for one thing, the angle beta i is by definition less than pi. Why are we trying to flip this edge? Well, only because beta i is less than pi. The two angles opposite the edge, theta i minus one and theta i plus one, those both have to be less than pi because, well, they're corners of triangles and triangles have angles on pi. And we're going to assume that none of these triangles are degenerate, right? They all have non-zero area, okay? And the remaining corner, alpha b min, is less than pi. Why? Well, that's how we know that this vertex needs to be shortened, right? It's not yet locally shortest because this angle is less than pi, and the angle of our uh, quadrilateral is contained within this angle, okay? So all four angles of our quadrilateral are less than pi, therefore it can't be non-convex. Okay, finally, in the simplicial case, this degree condition is really easy. The endpoints are all degree greater than one. Why is that? Well, all vertices in a simplicial complex have degree greater than one. Okay, hence this edge is flippable. As I said before, additional care is needed in the case of a general delta complex, but everything works out just fine. Okay, um, next we want to see that the algorithm actually makes progress. So in the simplicial case, flipping edge bi always decreases the degree of b. Why is that true? Well, because the vertices b, i minus 1, i, and i plus 1 are always distinct vertices. So when we perform this edge flip, we're always just kind of kicking out one of the vertices from the wedge. It's getting smaller. In the case of a general delta complex, we can have edges where both endpoints are incident on the vertex b from inside the wedge. Kind of crazy, hard to, hard to draw pictures of this, um, but everything still works out just fine, okay? And so what we can show is that upon an edge flip, the degree always decreases on at least one of the two ends of the edge and can't increase on the other one, okay? And then finally, something a little bit more geometric, uh, we wanna show that the final curve is shorter than the one we started with, or the new curve is shorter than the one we started with. Well, we know that the algorithm terminates when all angles are greater than or equal to pi. Right, so we start out like this, we flip this edge, we flip this edge, and now there's nothing left to flip, right? All the angles along the left side are greater than or equal to pi. And so what we know is that this path along the left side of the wedge is convex. It's a convex path contained in the convex hull of the three points A, B, and C. Why must it be that this new curve is shorter well, here we can use uh, something called the Crofton formula, which says the length of any curve is proportional to the expected number of intersections with a random line. So if we intersect 
this figure, this inner curve and this outer curve with random lines, then by convexity, every line that intersects the inner path intersects the outer path at least as many times. Hence, the inner path is shorter. Okay, and so we get a shorter path at the end of this procedure. Okay, so from here, we can use our local shortening procedure to globally shorten a curve, right? So far, all we've said is how to make the curve shorter at a single vertex. How do we straighten out a whole path? Well, this is where the grade comes in. So we just say, while the curve is not locally shortest, flip out the smallest wedge. Apply this algorithm to the, the smallest remaining wedge in the, in the curve. So given a non-crossing curve with fixed endpoints, what this is then gonna give us is a non-crossing geodesic in the same isotopy class relative to its endpoints. By non-crossing, I mean um, that the curve can touch itself, but we can still make an epsilon perturbation that makes it injective, that, that stops it from touching itself. And that's useful for uh, situations like this, where we want a curve to come in and make contact with itself just as a single vertex. A important theorem about this algorithm is that it finishes in a finite number of operations. And the crux of this proof is to use the fact that there are actually a finite number of intrinsic triangulations with edge lengths bounded by any fixed constant L0. So you could tell, take L0, for instance, uh, to be the, the length of the initial path. Interestingly enough, this little lemma or this little fact that we use is the same thing that lets you prove that the Delaunay flipping, the intrinsic Delaunay flipping algorithm finishes in a finite number of operations. So it seems to be a pretty fundamental result about intrinsic triangulations. Uh, in practice, just like this Delaunay flipping algorithm, it turns out we need very few flips to reach this locally shortest curve, this geodesic curve. Right, so in principle, you could imagine that you have to flip and flip and flip for you know exponentially many flips. In practice, this is not really how it, how it turns out. Okay, um, the same basic algorithm works for closed loops, with just a kind of small modification near termination. And what this is going to give us is a closed geodesic in the same isotopy class as the initial curve. Uh, interesting question is what happens on a convex domain? So generically, convex polyhedra don't have uh, closed geodesic loops, even though uh, smooth convex surfaces do, kind of an interesting fact. And so what's going to happen in this case is that the curve is going to contract, contract to a sort of discrete point. So a loop that just goes around a single degree one vertex. And that's kind of how you know, okay, to make that any shorter, you would just slide it to the end of the cone. Okay, so this is a pretty nice simple algorithm. Where can we apply it? Well, for one thing, in geometry processing, we usually specify uh, cuts through the surface or boundaries of segmentations or all sorts of other things as networks or paths of edges, okay? But as we've said many times now, there's really nothing special about these edges. They're kind of just an artifact of the way that the surface was triangulated or discretized. So especially for something like physical fabrication, um, we don't have to stick to the edges of the input mesh and we might like some smoother or straighter geodesic curves. Right? So we can apply the same algorithm just as before to a network of curves by doing the same greedy flip out procedure. Find a vertex that's not yet locally shortest, apply the flip out uh, procedure and repeat. Uh, another thing we could do is we could say, well, we actually don't wanna go too far from our initial curve, so we could limit the deviation in length. So we could say maybe stop the algorithm when the total curve length is uh, less than one half the initial length. And this will generally give us something close to the input, but smoother and straighter. So here's an example of taking a segmentation and smoothing it out using this flip-based approach. We can also use this algorithm for, uh, as a kind of a starting point for constructing other kinds of curves like geodesic Bezier curves by just applying standard uh, subdivision procedures from the plane. Uh, where this starts to get really interesting is when we start mixing geodesics and retriangulation. So an important idea in 2D is doing a constrained triangulation where we ask for a maximally Delaunay triangulation that contains the given uh, set of straight segments. And this is used, for instance, to compute the, a domain for solving some kind of simulation problem. Okay, now because we know how to talk about sort of straight segments or geodesics on polyhedral surfaces, and because we know how to uh, talk about various versions of Delaunay triangulation, with the surface as the background domain, we can just kind of translate this algorithm directly to surfaces. So here what we're gonna do is ask as input 
for just paths in the isotopy class that we care about, right? So some edge path that goes along and connects up the vertices in the right way. We're gonna flip these to geodesic. So this is our notion of these straight segments now. And then we can find a compatible Delaunay triangulation. So we could flip to Delaunay, or maybe we flip to Delaunay and do Delaunay refinement to also improve the quality of the elements. All these tools together, as we start to build up, okay, now we can do geodesics and intrinsic constrained Delaunay triangulation and refinement and Bezier's and all this kind of stuff. You know, where's this going? Well, it makes it really easy to start constructing really high quality uh, meshes for surface-based simulation and processing, including precise boundary conditions. We can do kind of all the same kinds of uh, tools and tricks that we had in the, the Euclidean plane. Finally, although it's not really our main focus, we can think about uh, shortest path problems, like computing the distance from one source vertex to all other vertices. So here, what we do, very roughly speaking, is to repeatedly apply this flip-out algorithm as we run Dijkstra's algorithm, right? So we start building our Dijkstra tree. You know, typically the Dijkstra tree doesn't have geodesic straight edges. It has these zigzagging edge paths, right? So what we do is as we build the Dijkstra tree, we straighten out those edges. And the result is actually pretty cool. What we get is a single triangulation of the surface that contains in its edges all geodesics to the source vertex. Right? So these are just crazy skinny triangles connecting up to the source. And it's important to point out that, again, we're not saying that we guarantee globally shortest geodesics, right? All we know is that we've straightened all these paths until they can't be straightened anymore. They're locally shortest geodesics. Nonetheless, when you do this, what you get is paths that are very, very close to minimal. So in this example, for instance, 95% of these red paths are actually the minimal length geodesics. And among the 5% that are not minimal length, none of them overestimate the distance by more than about 1%, okay? And so that's kind of funny. I mean, we didn't really do anything to try to make these, these paths minimal. Why is this happening? Well, I think one piece of intuition here is that you couldn't possibly have tons and tons and tons of geodesics on the surface simultaneously that are all too long, but are also all not crossing, right? So to simultaneously have all these geodesics to the, to the source, they kind of have to be pretty close to minimal. But a nice open question is, well, can you come up with some flip-based strategy to guarantee that actually 100% of these curves really are globally shortest? Another, another nice thing we can do at this point is, once we've computed this triangulation, we can just read off the angle of each of these paths at the source, and that's gonna give us a very accurate uh, logarithmic map for the surface, which is useful for lots of geometry processing tasks. Okay. Our last example is this headline that appeared in Quanta magazine not too long ago. And so the question is, if you start out at a vertex of a platonic solid, can you start walking straight ahead, walking along a geodesic, and return to where you started without passing through any other vertex? So do platonic solids have these kind of recurrent vertex-free paths? And this took a long time to figure out, but the answer turns out to be no, except in the case of the dodecahedron, where there is this recurrent walk. So we thought it'd be fun to see if we can recover the same result by just running our flip out algorithm on a dodecahedron. And indeed you can, if we start out with a loop and straighten it, we get this, this uh, single vertex path. And so the question is, okay, are there other interesting questions that people wanna answer about uh, geodesics on polyhedral surfaces where this, this algorithmic uh, approach might be helpful? Okay. So in summary, the main takeaway is really just the, the title of our paper. You can find exact geodesic paths in triangle meshes by just greedily flipping edges. And so this continues to be sort of a theme in intrinsic algorithms where you get some useful object by doing greedy flips, right? We saw you could get the intrinsic Delaunay triangulation. You can get these geodesic paths. There's another algorithm I didn't mention uh, by Lee Mosher that if you have two triangulations of the same polyhedron, you can find out how to flip from one to the other by a greedy flipping strategy, uh, and so on. So there's, there seems to be something about greedy algorithms, greedy flipping algorithms beyond just this, this Delaunay uh, flip procedure. Uh, nice thing about this algorithm is, okay, it applies beyond just paths, so loops and curve networks, and is, is quite general. And most importantly, that it easily lets us integrate uh, construction of geodesics with construction of nice triangulations on the surface. 
And so this is really useful for geometry processing. It kind of elevates a lot of the tools that we had from 2D computational geometry to polyhedral surfaces. So over the years, there's been tons of work on algorithms for exact polyhedral geodesics, uh, especially this single source shortest path problem. Uh, but I would actually say that given how ridiculously fast algorithms already are, kind of this race to the bottom on performance really doesn't make it any sense anymore, right? We're already at the point where on meshes with millions of triangles, we can get results in like a hundredth of a second. And so my feeling is that effort in this area is a lot better spent thinking about kind of richer ways we can now integrate all this great technology for computing geodesics into the kind of broader geometry processing pipeline. How can we make this more flexible? How can we make this do uh, kind of interesting things? Okay, so just to wrap up, uh, this intrinsic viewpoint has been building up for many years, starting in the smooth setting and gradually getting into discrete and computational algorithms. But my feeling is that we've really just barely scratched the surface. And so here are a bunch of kind of interesting open questions. Um, so one interesting question, very natural one, is whether we can extend some of this thinking about intrinsic triangulations to higher dimensional cases, like let's say the three dimensional case. So for instance, it's not hard to define what intrinsic triangulations mean in higher dimensions, right? We just have a, a topological triangulation of an n-manifold with simplex-wise Euclidean geometry, okay? What about Delaunay? Well, that's also not too hard to define, right? So we could say an intrinsic Delaunay triangulation in, in n-dimensions is, well, you just take two n-simplices that share an n-minus one-dimensional face. Um, you can always embed those into R n isometrically, okay? And then you ask that their circumscribing n balls must be empty, right? So just kind of the, the ordinary Delaunay triangulation, but you do it pair by pair. Well, this is a easy enough definition. Um, sadly enough, the kind of ways that we computed intrinsic Delaunay triangulations for two-dimensional surfaces won't work directly or immediately, uh, even in three dimensions. So one thing that's known about kind of a flip-based approach to Delaunay triangulation in, in R3 is that you can't always reach a Delaunay configuration by doing what are called bistellar flips. So bistellar flip is kind of a natural generalization of this edge flip that we've been uh, looking at. So if you have two tets that share a face, you'll replace them with uh, kind of three tets that share an edge and vice versa. Right? An edge and a, a triangle are, are dual to each other in three dimensions. And the problem is that in two dimensions, we never had to worry about non-convex pairs of triangles because you can show pretty easily that if a triangle pair is non-convex, then it's already Delaunay. You don't have to flip it. In 3D, you can have pairs of tetrahedra meeting at a face that are non-convex, but also not Delaunay. And if you go and try to fix this by applying a bistellar flip, well, then you get this awful invalid configuration where tets are overlapping, okay? So a very basic question is, is there any algorithm for finding intrinsic Delaunay triangulations in dimension greater than or equal to three? And in fact, uh, although the existence of Delaunay triangulations in R3 is well established, there's also a question of, do intrinsic Delaunay triangulations even exist always in three dimensions or higher, okay? So a lot of interesting questions there. Another very important question is how to recover an extrinsic description from an intrinsic one. So, so far we've been saying, hey, isn't it great that we can just work with the intrinsic geometry and not worry about the embedding, but there's certainly cases where you'd like to be able to see what's going on. Take your, take your intrinsic triangulation and draw it in, in three-dimensional space. So a basic version of this problem is given a discrete metric, edge lengths, uh, find vertex positions in R3 or Rn that realize this metric, right? So find vertex positions such that if I now measure the distance between vertex positions along each edge, I get the prescribed edge length. In the convex case, this is always possible as shown by Alexandrov. And there's even a nice algorithm by Bobenko and Izmestiev that does this, like a real practical algorithm that does this and actually takes advantage of these intrinsic edge flips. But algorithms for the general non-convex case are still not completely satisfactory. So if you look at kind of older literature from geometry processing that say, yeah, we kind of solved this problem, actually they tend to sort of secretly sneak in extrinsic data such as dihedral angles or normals or something else. 
And then more recent methods that, that really do use purely intrinsic data to embed the metric in space um, are, again, not completely satisfactory. So they might be a little unstable, they might be over-regularized, so they're smoother than the actual intrinsic metric you had. Um, and in general, they just don't provide any hard guarantees that you really will be able to embed this thing. So the grand challenge is to, to solve this for real. Like I really wanna be able to go out into the world and take measurements of geometry using only lengths and then recover perfectly the, the three-dimensional shape, okay? An even harder version of this problem is that I'm given just a polyhedral metric and want to find an embedding into R3. And for a moment you might stop and think, well, wait a minute, how is this any different from the problem we just talked about, right? And the difference this time around is that in this case, I'm not gonna tell you a priori which intrinsic triangulation admits a face-wise linear embedding into space, right? So for instance, a cube, of course, can be embedded in three-dimensional space. There's a picture of it right there. But it's not true that any intrinsic triangulation of the cube can be embedded in a piecewise linear or piecewise affine way, right? And so the question is, um, is finding an embeddable triangulation of a given metric just as hard as finding the embedding itself? Or is there something you can do ahead of time? Is, is it easier to find a, a triangulation that satisfies some embeddability criteria Then once you have that triangulation, you can just focus on this first version of the problem where you don't have to flip edges? One kind of brute force approach to this is to say, well, <laughs> one thing we could do is just cut along all uh, geodesics connecting all pairs of points, so all order n squared geodesics. Um, this way you know you will be able to bend that intrinsic metric into the, the extrinsic shape, hopefully, um, but it's still not kind of an ironclad algorithm. We've tried this out and kind of forced it to work on a couple examples, but, but really still not a completely satisfactory answer. Okay, so in the past two lectures, we've seen lots of interesting questions seeking good answers. Just to recap, um, we talked about intrinsic coarsening. So is there a natural way to actually remove cone points from the intrinsic metric in a meaningful way or a useful way? Uh, what about the efficiency of the intrinsic flip algorithm? So we know that there's no way to bound this in terms of the number of elements of the mesh, but in practice, it actually seems to take a very small number of flips, something like the number of edges. So can we explain this empirical behavior by thinking more about the, the geometry of the domain rather than just the number of elements? Uh, is there a vector Ripa theorem? So does the intrinsic Delaunay triangulation minimize some natural notion of vector Dirichlet energy, just like it minimizes the scalar Dirichlet energy? Uh, can this geodesic flipping algorithm be modified to yield 100% minimal geodesics for the single source problem? Uh, is there any algorithm at all that will produce an intrinsic triangulation, an intrinsic Delaunay triangulation in dimension three or greater? Is there a more geometric notion of discrete locality, kind of a more natural notion of what it means for discrete Laplacian to be uh, local, and can we find a perfect Laplacian with respect to these, this notion of locality? And is there a, an algorithm that's guaranteed to provide an exact reconstruction of a given uh, discrete metric in the general non-convex case? So once we've done all our intrinsic processing, can we actually see what this intrinsic metric looks like? And on and on and on. I have all sorts of interesting questions. Uh, if you think you have answers or, or wanna, wanna know more, uh, let's talk. Before wrapping up, I just wanna mention that there are free and open source implementations of a lot of the data structures and algorithms uh, that I've shown. Many thanks to, uh, to my student, Nick. So please go ahead and try them out. If you'd like, we'd love to hear about what does work and also what doesn't work for you and what we can improve. Um, at a very high level, I think this topic of intrinsic triangulations is a great example of how math and computer science can work together to create some beautiful stuff, taking uh, deep theory on the mathematical side, like from Ramanian geometry, normal surface theory, and hyperbolic geometry, and connecting it with some important contemporary problems, such as grappling with all this difficult data that we're now encountering. What we've done so far already provides some pretty major utility for geometry processing with lots of quality guarantees and structural guarantees and so forth, um, and especially for providing a bridge between sort of good existing algorithms that, that don't necessarily work on, on really challenging data and 
kind of bad data or non-manifold data or point clouds or other stuff beyond these nice manifold meshes that we're used to working with in geometry processing. So we kind of get a little bit of a, a new Swiss army knife uh, for geometry processing, but there are many, many open questions still remaining. And I, I hope I've inspired you to think about some of these. All right, thanks very much for your attention.